Chapter 8, Prisons and Openings. So now is a time where we might begin to wonder what has become of Sita. Last we saw her, she was flying through the air in the arms of a horrific demon god king, begging for help and throwing away her valuables. Now where is she? Well, she's quite a long way down to the south of India, on an isle then known only as Lanka. Really, the Ramayana is the story of how Lanka got her Shri. And she's been carried from Ravana's landing pad through a very lush and glowing garden, growing all varieties of aromatic herbs into the corridors of a palace that would put the proudest banana republic dictator to shame with the grandeur of its marble walls and the silkiness of its epic tapestries displaying the history of Ravana's rise to power. She's not looking at a very deep blue piece with emerald trim showing Ravana engaged in cunnilingus with some sort of water nymph. She realizes upon seeing the next one that this woman is the queen of these nymphs because in the one she is looking at now, the border is trimmed in ruby, but the rest of it the same color. Ravana is biting the head off of a blue king in a crown while the woman whose holy of holies Ravana was tonguing in the previous tapestry screams in horror. The work is of a photographic quality. She realizes that the chronological order of the pictures is set so that she sees what came later before what precedes it. The deeper within the twisting halls, she guesses, the deeper into the past. She gets the impression that he wanted her to see these tapestries particularly. She gets an arm free again, and though she is exhausted from her previous struggle, she manages to surprise him and break a nose in such a way that the bone of it goes into the brain of that head. That head slumps down, but he has nine more. He yelps with surprise for a moment, then with his free hand resets the nose of that head. You will be among my greatest conquests. His laughter, the tailing tendrils of it, as no sound really has an end, reach back up to the mountainside on which Hanuman has stopped, those two noble Kshatriya behind him, panting. Oh, but which way was it from here? Hanuman ponders, not looking at the two who are following him. He knows the way, but sees that they are winded and does not wish to call attention to it. Was it a right at this banana tree, or a left? He begins walking very slowly up a well-worn path. How much farther is it, O oh wise monkey? Lakshman asks in a very controlled voice, betraying his lack of breath only with a slight pause around the O. Oh. He spoke before addressing his guide. He looks down and sees how steep the fall is. I know you are in a great hurry, great warrior. I am now plotting the fastest possible course. If we had not had scaled that cliff, then we would have had to go around the mountain twice to reach this point. Believe me. I know the urgency of a lost wife. Be at ease, Lakshman. Rama coos. Hanuman veers suddenly to an outcropping of rocks. Please, sit here a moment. My liege is not well used to visitors, and I shall have to introduce your names before I introduce yourselves. What? We're here? Lakshman gasps, unable to hide his relief. Well, Lord, we're always here. That's the meaning of the word. Hanuman cackles as he disappears behind the rock. A moment later, Hanuman is bowing calmly before Sugriva, the grievous cast-out king of the apes in his makeshift throne room. King Sugriva, I got the visitors for you. They're not assassins, but heroes. Rama and Lakshman. 
The bear growls, not unkindly. You brought them here? To the heart of our haven? Rama and Lakshman? Heroes? Never heard of any such heroes. To be a hero, shouldn't you be famous? Jambavan, how can you not know Rama and Lakshman? Hanuman sits down on the floor, surprised. We all know who he is. The other monkeys look around with blank faces. The kind of blank faces of monkeys who are pretending to know what they're supposed to know. None willing to admit that they have not heard of these two very important people. Hanuman sees these glances and knows their meaning immediately. Okay, maybe we don't. That's right. I heard of them before I met you. They really are great demon slayers. They come from the north. They are the heirs to a king called... Uh, I forget his name. He gives a little monkey giggle. But anyway, they are not from Bali. And I think they can help you get Kishkanda back. And your wife. They're looking for a stolen wife, too. So your problem will be very close to their hearts. Anuman, Jambavan the bear interrupts. You're not speaking to the points. What proof do you have that these men you brought to our back door mean us no harm? Only the highest proof, Brother Bear. What proof is that? The proof of my heart, of my senses. No amount of words can convince my heart of a story that is not true. And the more untrue a story, the more proofs there will be offered to convince the listener of its truth. They offered no proof. And I asked for none. I could smell the pain of loss and separation. Could hear the hope when they realized that I was one of the Banaras and could help. Old Jatayu sent them. That meddlesome bird. Jambavan groans. Ah, relax, Jamba. Our suffering is nearly over. These men really can't help us. And a tear reaches Hanuman's eye. Anyway, it is not fitting to speak ill of the dead. Ill of the dead? Jamavan asks suddenly, then realizes his meaning. Jatayu is dead. Remember the woman in the sky and the jewels that she dropped? No one answers. They all understand that a great friend has passed from the world. There is a grieving moment. Finally, Sukriva speaks for the first time. It is sad that Jatayu has passed. Even in his death, though, that Mahatma helps us. He sends us our deliverance. Please, hurry and bring these warriors, Hanuman. The monkey in me wants to jump around the room, breaking things with joy. I can hardly sit still. Hurry. Hanuman had already gone to get the two heroes before the king of the apes in exile finished speaking.